My name is Monk Rowe, and we are in Manhattan filming the Hamilton College Jazz Archive. I'm very pleased to have Jimmy Wormworth with me here. Welcome. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you. It's, uh, I've been looking forward to this because, you know, I, I've heard your name over the years so often being, do, being up in Utica, and uh, you make unfortunate trips up there on occasion. Not lately, but yeah, yeah. I, I used to go up pretty frequently, yeah. visit my mother and my aunts, and play gigs with JR, and yeah. Sal Mystico. And People talk about, up there anyway, they talk about how Central New York uh, used to be a pretty good music uh, avenue. Mean, Utica's remarkable. Uh, in the middle 30s, in the height of the big band era, uh, uh, there were some really great musicians, some of who came here and made a mark for themselves. Freddie Zito, uh, uh, Phil Olivello, uh, a few. Uh, uh, in the 30s in Utica, my father uh, played with Billy Holiday and uh, uh, Helen Humes. I know because I worked with Helen Humes later and she told me about it. Oh, that's cool. I knew your father. Wow. I said, well, what'd you know about him? Well, he was good looking, but he could play too. <laughs> never when, showed me a thing. I, I never lived with him. I, uh -huh. uh, uh, I didn't get to know him at, at all until I was a teenager out playing and working oh, gigs with him. You know. He had some pretty good background. He was very talented. Uh, it's interesting that you ended up playing the drums too. Yeah, my first love was the piano, really. Uh -huh. I really wish I was a piano player. I think. It, I think certain instruments fit certain personalities. I've talked to drummers about it. I talked to Grady Tate, and he said, yeah, I'm cocky as hell. <laughs> and most of the drummers I know are Art Blakey. They are definitely extroverts. Extroverts, <laughs> for they, sure. And they believe in themselves a lot. Uh -huh. They have a lot of confidence. Uh, Elvin, who's more confident <laughs> straight ahead than Elvin? <laughs> most of the drummers I know who I admire, they tend to have a, a, a some swagger. Max definitely has swagger. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think I have a short attention span. I, I tend to uh, be intensely interested for a minute and then all of a sudden I get distracted. Uh, I think I have ADD. <laughs> 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 My colleague and friend Tardo Hammer, the piano player who works with Charles Davis, which is one who I work with now, and, uh, he said, no, nah, I don't think you have ADD. <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I think I do. Well, I can't concentrate. I don't know. You just move from one drum to the next. You know, <laughs> you got enough drums there to take care of it. I think. But a piano player can uh, uh, can lay out when you're accompanying. Mm. Yeah. Uh, or for that matter, you can end your solo anytime you want. And I think I'd be better suited for that. Plus, I like to solo. Mm -hmm. And I have such bad feet, I can't stand up. So, uh -huh. <laughs> so forget about trumpet, saxophone, bass, yeah. and all that. <laughs> well, you had uh, not only your your father was musical, but your uncle My also. Uncle Dick Mariani, yeah. yeah. I think they were equally. They had equal level of talent, uh -huh. which was I, in my uh, estimation, a high level. Both mm -hmm. of them. So I'm not sure which side of the family I got the genes from, assuming mm -hmm. I have any genes that there <laughs> with yeah. musical talent. But, uh, but I got it. Yeah, my, that, that's how my mother met my father. My mother and my aunts used to be sort of like in groupies because uh -huh. they came with the band. How were with the band? <laughs> I see. In the big band era in the 30s yeah. and 40s. And uh, I think my Uncle Dick took my mother and maybe a couple of my aunts on one of his gigs and my father was there. and. My mother and father got hooked up. It was pretty revolutionary for that time. Yeah. 36. 36. So, yeah. Yeah. And um, um, my father never showed me anything, even though I know he's a great drummer. Mm -hmm. I saw him sit down and play for about a minute one time, just soloing, and I was flabbergasted. But he gave up the drums for the piano. Um, um, he maybe, uh, how should I characterize it? Uh, I think he was something of a, a, I don't even know how to characterize it. He wasn't in the mainstream <laughs> of society. Mm -hmm. He kind of functioned that. Uh, well, his parents were uh, in black society in Utica. My grandfather was a church deacon and a 33rd degree Prince Hall Mason. 
which is uh, the Prince Hall Masons were the black counterparts of Mas the, the Masonics, right. the Masonic right. Temple, yeah. Uh, and um, a 33rd degree level in Masonry is the highest level you can achieve in both the Prince Hall Masons and the the original Mason. Yeah. And um, he died, uh, I guess, uh, close to a year before I was born, so I never got the chance to meet him. But from what my mother and my aunts told me, uh, my father had a brand new Rio convertible in high school, and he and two or three other guys integrated Utica Free Academy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I heard a couple of stories about that. Yeah. He was kind of a spoiled brat, the sky and in the black community. Uh, 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 the, the, uh, uh, well-to-do kid and he was an only child and I think maybe uh, partly conflicts pers you know psychological conflicts about questions of race and his standing in his own community might have conflicted him and caused him to uh, have problems with himself he became an alcoholic and uh, that's I think the main reason he gave up the drums <laughs> Uh, to get out of that life? Well, no, because he sort of like Lester Young said, well, man, the girls <laughs> are going with all these other guys while I'm packing up the drugs. <laughs> right. I think my father was a little variation of that. He, he uh, <laughs> didn't want to carry all that stuff when he got a little feeling good at the end of the gig. So he yeah. ended up playing piano, and he played very well. <laughs> That's right. And uh, I, I, for whatever reason, neglected to ask Helen Humes when I worked with her whether my father had played piano with her or drums. Oh. I'm inclined to think he probably played mm -hmm. piano with her. So um, singers like like her and Billie Holiday, they would come through town and would I they pick up... I get the impression they stayed in Utica for a period of time uh -huh. or worked around that area, around central New York. That's the impression I get. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you, you can find out about yeah. that somewhere. Uh, right. So many of those people are gone now. Uh, yeah. My father was a close friend of uh, Billy Kyle, the great pianist, and curiously enough, uh, I was a close friend of the late Al Haig, worked with him for a long time, and became a really close personal friend, and uh, mm -hmm. one of his idols was Billy Kyle. <laughs> and, uh, Who were the musical um, people in Utica that you kind of looked up to at the time? Uh, well, I started getting out playing pretty early when I was uh, uh, playing with the older guys, that is, the jazz musicians when I was about 15 or 16. I think I met, uh, well, the first guys I met were, were Gordon Smith, Vic Kirch, uh, uh, and Vic Kirch's band when he still had the rock and roll band. And my mother said, well, you want to learn about this music, you might as well go visit your father. So I went to one of his gigs at Thompson's in Whitesboro, and he had Gordon Smith and Billy Grimes playing the bass, and my father playing piano, and that place was jammed with all the kids from Proctor High School and Whitesboro Central School and UFA mm -hmm. doing the 50s thing, <laughs> the early 50s thing. So they would have been playing... Uh, Vic played uh, music like uh, Fanny Brown, Wyoming Harris music. Uh, the, the so-called race music of the, of the early 50s. Uh -huh. And uh, the Utica kids ate it up. And, uh, and I went in and heard, he had this fabulous rhythm section. Gordon Smith was truly a great drummer. If he had lived, uh, he had a heart defect and died Labor Day of 1959. I think he was 28. Uh, but if he had lived and had come to New York, which is where he was born, um, yes. he really was a great drummer. Uh, uh, to me, he was his uh, level of accomplishment artistically was that of an Arthur Taylor or Philly Joe. Even mm -hmm. he was uh, uh, distinctive. His his style was easily recognizable. Anybody who heard him, and it was fairly unique, not unlike an Elvin Jones or a no. Philly Joe. Yeah, he was really uh, no, and he was pretty wise for his age too. He seemed old to me then. I was 17 and yeah. 16. And, uh, but he taught me things about life and mm -hmm. music as well. When you got out and started playing, can you recall uh, what kind of money you would have made? 
My first gig, uh, my first uh, play, uh, uh, first time I played for money, I was 13 years old. And uh, we played at Wysocki's restaurant on New Year's Eve in West Utica. And it was a bunch of high school guys. Louis Angelini, who I think is the uh, professor of music at Utica College. Yes, indeed. We didn't call him Louis, we called him Gino. That's because his parents called him Gino. He uh -huh. lived near me. <laughs> and uh, He played piano? Played piano. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jimmy McIntyre, an alto saxophonist who I think ended up owning a music store somewhere near Richfield Springs or somewhere like that. Uh, uh, oh man, good as I know. Uh, John Avolio, who I think became a music teacher and moved to Michigan. His father owned Avolio Electric near Proctor High School. Um, the saxophonist was, uh, gee, I can't remember his last name, but as I know him, he once came into Fives, but he became a school teacher too. Uh, and he became a, a, a well, he came into Five Spot once when I was working there in 1959. He was surprised to see me. I was surprised to see him. <laughs> I think bet. he was teaching in Mount Vernon or somewhere in uh -huh. Westchester at the time. They became music teachers. And they were in high school and I was still in grade school, and they hired me to play this gig with them. Jimmy McGuire, that was the saxophonist's name. I th last I heard quite a while ago, he owned a music store somewhere uh -huh. outside of Utica. Uh, but um, I guess by the time I was 16, I met Tori and Ronnie Zito. Yeah. And um, I had started out in high school taking auto mechanics because one of my aunts said, well, suppose you don't make it in music. You have something to fall back on. The old fall back on. <laughs> exactly. Thing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the old, you it's fall. one word, fall back on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> something like alpaca. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I listened to her and took auto mechanics for about two and a half years in high school, totally wasting my time. I'm horrible in mathematics. And you need to know geometry and stuff to be mm -hmm. a machine. You, you have to have machinist skills to be a really good auto mechanic and so forth. And I was a 98-pound weakling and couldn't loosen the bolts on, <laughs> engine, on uh, uh, engine heads and all that. And, and then finally I realized, well, look, this is a waste of my time. I love cars, but I'm not good at it. I'm good at music. I'm a teenager and I'm playing with grown-ups. And they're telling me, I'm good. Right? So I switched to a music course, I think in my senior year, <laughs> or, or, or late junior year. Uh -huh. Had to sort of go back and Was it U at again. UFA? No, at Proctor. At Proctor. Mm -hmm. Ronnie Zito went to UFA. We were best friends and like, it was like being on opposite sides of the country yeah. at that time as a teenager. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, I started the music courses, took rudiments of music and history of music and so forth. The rudiments teaches you key signatures and so forth. Before theory where you learn right. harmony and all that. And, uh, and I got this bug that I wanted to write some arrangements like Jerry Mulligan's quartet with no piano and I did. Just by sort of in my head solfeggio. And somehow, well, I, I got some guys in my high school who played in the orchestra to come to my house and try to play the arrangements and they didn't have a clue. It sounded pretty horrible. The notes were all right, but their phrasing, they didn't have a uh -huh. clue. They weren't interested in jazz and they right. weren't really talented. They just happened to play instruments. Right. And then, uh, I don't know, somehow I got hooked up with uh, Ronnie and Tori Zito and I went to their house and brought my arrangements and they played them. I said, that's, a, that's, that's, yeah. a, that's what I meant. <laughs> that was my last uh, foray into writing. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I, I guess that sort of was my uh, entree to uh, meeting uh, Sal Amico and Vic Kurtz. J.R. was already living in New York. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, Ernie Washington and Gordon Smith and these other guys. And uh, Ernie Washington was truly a great artist, a great pianist who had some of the greatest facility. He could play as fast as anybody I ever heard. And he played trumpet, too, as a hobby. But he played trumpet. He sounded like, to me, like uh, Idris Suleiman, the big, fat sound. And it sounded like he blew hard. Curiously enough, his embouchure was over here, not in the middle. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, but he had 
had a piano studio in New Haven near Yale and taught privately and I think he was from Philadelphia and he grew up with those older guys the Heath brothers and uh, and he hit, once told me that uh, the first place Charlie Parker ever stayed in New York was at Ernie's apartment here in New York and um, it's really a shame that uh, he didn't get well documented uh, he was a friend of Ray Bryant and John Dennis John Count Dennis Hmm. who died young, but who was a contemporary of Ray Bryant's. He was also from Philly, John mm -hmm. Dennis. And, uh, there was a small place in Little Falls called the Corner Tavern. And a friend who had a car drove me there a couple of times and said, wow, you can't believe some of the pianists they're bringing in here. Just guys doing a single. And the two guys I saw were Ray Bryant and John Dennis. And it was just astounding. Well, you ended up playing with uh, one of your childhood uh, heroes, or heroines, should I say. Yeah, Nellie Lutcher. Nellie yeah. Lutcher. Mm -hmm. well, uh, in 1946, uh, around January, not long after Christmas, one of my uncles, who was stationed in the Pacific in World War II, came home, and with some of the money he had saved from his allotment, which he sent to my grandmother, uh, not long after he got home, he, he was influenced by probably my Uncle Dick and maybe my aunts to buy a, a record player. Well, a, what in those days was called a combination. It was a console, a record player, and radio mm -hmm. uh, when there were still 78s. It was the latest thing, Zenith. <laughs> and uh, uh, so he bought this, con this, this record player and radio combination. and. Um, I can remember on a weekend, uh, probably around March of 46, which was maybe two or three months after my uncle was discharged from the service and came home, uh, my mother and one or two of my aunts and my uncle Dick and my uncle Alfred went to the Melody House record store, which used to be on Blandina Street, uh, just off Genesee Street, just mm -hmm. east of Genesee Street, and they were having a huge sale on records. And their records were all 78s then. And I can remember going there with them, and they just bought up all kinds of records. And the records ranged from uh, uh, Tommy Dorsey's band, uh, with uh, one or two records where Buddy Rich played solos, to uh, uh, I guess Tommy Dorsey's band with Joe Stafford, and uh, all kinds of records, including Nellie Lutcher's latest hits, an album of uh, on Capital Americana of Art Tatum, and a whole bunch of uh, Nat Cole trio singles, mm -hmm. and um, I think that's really when my obsession with, or my interest in playing yeah. really took off. I think I was nine or ten, um, and I just gravitated toward these Nat Cole trio records, uh, and. Nellie Lutcher's trio records, which were big hits. Nat Cole was pretty popular, but that was before he became just a singer and stopped playing. But it was after he was just a pianist and played with jazz at the Philharmonic and made records with wh whoever. Yeah. He was a great pianist. I think that's pretty indisputable. Mm -hmm. I think that's why he was such a good singer. He had good instrument, good yeah. vocal cords, and, and such knowledge. Music. Yeah. So. Uh, um, and those records and those Art Tatum records just just took me off in the whole direction of music. Uh, I used to beg my, I was spoiled rotten, and I'd beg my mother and my aunt, oh, I don't feel good, can I stay home from school? Uh, all right, honey, what's the wrong? And I'd stay home and all I would do is play those records over and over and play passages. I got to the point when I was about 11 where I had a lot of the passages memorized, Art Tatum passages, and the whole Nat Cole records, each record memorized, the solos, the vo vocals, the intro, mm -hmm. the endings, and, uh, and I was hooked. That's <laughs> fascinating. And it just sort of went on from there. Uh -huh. uh, um, uh, I really can't remember uh, what influenced me after the period where I first discovered those Nat Cole and Art Tatum and Nellie Lutcher records. Uh, 
there was a period, like I guess from around the time I was 12 or so to when, when I started playing, that I don't remember listening to any newer records. But around 14, I started getting interested in some of Jerry Mulligan's work and Shorty Rogers' Giants. And um, that's when I started trying to write. <laughs> when I was about 15 or 16, uh -huh. I tried to write. But that, that interested me. And Dave Rubeck's octet interested me for a while. Uh -huh. And then I think uh, by the time I was 16 or so, uh, it was when I met uh, Gordon Smith and Ernie Washington and Sal Amico and those guys. And they told me, well, look, man, you heard of Charlie Parker. Now you're going to have to check him out. And a few, uh, the first time I heard Charlie Parker and Dizzy or whoever, it sounded so futuristic to me. I could tell it was that uh, technically it was virtuosic, but I don't think artistically it made an immediate impression on me. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't long after that that it did. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know, to me, Charlie Parker and Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington are, well, what, what do you call them? The, the, well, the beacons of the music, the arbiter. The, um, it took me on, uh, to middle age before I appreci could appreciate uh, artists from the period of music that came before the period I grew into. Mm -hmm. Except for Art Tatum and, and uh, well, Art Tatum to me was the precursor of bebop. And Nat Cole already was, could be considered a, a bebop player. Huh? To me, he grew out of that Earl Hines school. To me, there were two schools, Art Tatum percussive school and the Earl Hines lyrical sort of flowery school. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, uh, Bud Powell came from the Art Tatum school and uh, Tommy Flanagan or, or uh, Nat Cole came from the Earl Hines school. But, um, uh, well, I thought Charlie Parker, uh, W without much uh, time put in listening to him, uh, just mesmerized me. Uh, to me, he was definitely a genius, a musical genius. Uh, and uh, then I was just really hooked on the music that started with him and, and came after, mm -hmm. the so-called hard, hard bop musicians. Yeah. Me uh, and, uh, well, tell me what it's like to go out you know, and start playing with, uh, when you started playing with Nellie Lutcher, you were how old? 20. Okay. Uh, I was pretty self-confident. Well, some people would describe it as jerky <laughs> <laughs> or conceited, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, well, I loved her music, and it was such a pleasure to play it, and I consider myself fortunate to have fallen into this position where I could play with somebody who, whose music I knew so well and who I loved, or whose music I loved so much, whose work I loved. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess I consider myself pretty fortunate, but I think somewhere in the back of my mind I thought I deserved it as well. And I, it, it, it was pretty easy to me. I had, I had really good chops. I had excellent training, technical training, from the late George Claskins, mm -hmm. who was Central New York's in my estimation, was Central New York's uh, greatest drum and percussion teacher. Uh, was he pretty demanding? Um, yeah, but he, uh, he, you it know, worked, he either huh? took, took it or le left it. Uh, yeah. he, he, he told you what, to, what was required, and either you did it or he cut you loose. Well, mm -hmm. you want to play or don't you? <laughs> well, this is what you have to do yeah. for next week. <laughs> He'd put an O on the page of uh, on the the page uh, uh, of work you were supposed to uh, uh, accomplish uh, until your next lesson, which was about a week. And then he'd put a K if you, if he thought you uh, oh, I see. Uh, uh, mastered whatever was exercises he had given you. That's neat. And uh, oh, I, I honestly don't remember practicing at all. I can remember one of my aunts threatening me to practice so I must have practiced some, but I know I, uh, I went through his whole course in about two and a half years, from 10 to about 12 and a half. Uh -huh. And it included a few books. Started out with a book he had written, a beginner's book that taught you four strokes. 
and then taught you how to put the strokes together to make up the 26 rudiments. And then he used the Haskell Haar books, which were pretty well known in, in that time period, in the 50s, late 40s, early 50s. And then uh, he put me through George Lawrence Stone's Stick Control, which is a pretty renowned book. Most accomplished drummers know of it, if, mm -hmm. even if they didn't uh, study it, which I think a lot did. A lot of drummers did. Uh, he was based in Boston, George Lawrence Stone, and seems to me all the drummers I know who came from Boston, Alan Dawson, uh, Tony Williams, uh, who else? A couple of others uh, had were really accomplished technicians. Mm -hmm. Could play fast and complicated, and uh, uh, and I can't help. Oh, Roy Haynes, of course, and I can't help but think that George Lawrence Stone's uh, teaching and and his book in particular uh, influenced those guys. Yeah. When you were out on uh, the road in the, let's see, this would have been the 50s? I went out with Nellie in January of 58 okay. for four months. And then, yeah. um, let's see, I, uh, I guess uh, Christmas of 58, the Christmas holidays, three weeks, I went to Chicago for three weeks with Phineas a Newborn. Yeah. What were the accommodations like at that time? Uh, curiously enough, with Nellie, um, we occasionally stayed in the, the, the top-rated hotels, but mm -hmm. occasionally we would have to, Morris and I would have to stay uh, at a rooming house or, for example, in St. Louis at a, a black hotel in the black neighborhood. Mm -hmm. In St. Louis, uh, we couldn't uh, we couldn't circulate in the club. Only Nellie could. We had to stay in the kitchen. And um, in uh, Miami, Ohio, New Miami, Ohio, uh, outside of Cincinnati, where the University of Miami of Ohio is, uh, it was the same thing. Yeah, that was pretty curious. Do you and, remember and Kansas City was the same thing. I remember Nellie stayed in uh, Hilton or whatever, Sher yeah. Sheraton or whatever, downtown. And we stayed in a black hotel in, I guess, the black district near the club where we were appearing. Did it anger you at the time? Uh, I, think I, I think I resented it. I was kind of new to that. I really grew up with my white side of the family. And yeah. I was treated like with privilege and... I was pretty much accepted uh, by the kids in the neighborhood. I was just another kid in the neighborhood, and uh, yeah, I, I I faced discrimination. I didn't have any dates until I got out of high school. Mm -hmm. um, um, but that that definitely surprised me. Yeah, and uh, well, that was 1958, and I thought that was kind of late in the day. <laughs> But it wasn't but as it far wasn't as the civil it was rights. Before the civil rights yeah. movement, really, yeah. or before what's commonly referred to as the civil right. rights movement. Right. I think there always was a civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. yeah. Marcus Garvey. Uh, right. Well, tell me how um, Lambert Hendricks and Russ came about. Um. Well, from what I understand, uh, I was their second drummer. Mm -hmm. I took Walter Bolden's place. Um, that was after they had recorded their first Columbia album, the hottest new group in jazz. Um, from what I understand, uh, John had moved to New York. Dave had lived here. I'm not sure if he was from here, but he had lived here. And he wrote, uh, I'm sure it's fairly common knowledge, that he wrote the arrangements for uh, Charlie Parker's uh, uh, Old Folks, the vocal arrangements, mm -hmm. and a few others. And on the record, I think the vocal, the vocal group is called the Dave Lambert Singers. Yeah. And uh, so he was known for vocal writing and, I guess, or organizing choral groups, uh, jazz-oriented choral groups. And uh, um, John, I think, had just moved to New York not too long before he and Dave met up. I'm not sure how they met up. I, it could, I think it maybe it could have come from uh, Annie influencing Dave 
through her vocalese uh, work, mm -hmm. Twisted. I think she had done that on the West Coast with Wardell Gray and Art Farmer, I think. And uh, she was the niece of Ella Logan, the Hollywood actress, producer. Oh, right. And Annie was a British citizen. Well, I think she had dual citizenship. But at any rate, she spent her childhood here in L.A. in the movie. She was in the Argane comedies. She was one of the Argane kids. And um, I think she more or less grew up in, in L.A. and Hollywood. And, uh, but she became a jazz singer. And, uh, and then I guess she moved to New York, uh, I guess in the middle 50s or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how that whole stuff coalesced, but they got the... It's been written about. Yeah, but you ended up with them after their first... After their Columbia. first Columbia album was half completed. Okay. That was after they had made their albums, I think, on Verve or... I forget, ABC Paramount, Sing a Song of Basie, Sing Along with Basie. Right. Sing a Song of Basie was the multi-track right. overdubbing. Sing a Song of Basie was with Basie's band, but I think Nat Pierce played piano, not Basie, yeah, and Joe right. Williams sang. And they didn't over, John, Dave, and Annie didn't overdub anything. They right. just sang uh, along with the band, I think. Yep. And then they were signed. They, that was such a splash. I can remember hearing them on the radio all the time before I ever knew any of them. Uh, uh, curiously enough, John Hendricks came into Five Spot a few times while I was working there from January to, to May of 59 with Mel Waldron as the house rhythm section. And, but I didn't know who he was and I had heard this guy, John Hendricks. John Hendricks is John Hendricks. I said, who is this John Hendricks? And who is this guy who comes into Five Spot all the time? <laughs> He's glad and handed everybody and yeah. saying hello. <laughs> I can see eventually, it. <laughs> eventually they were put together. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they were a big hit, and they were favorites of some influential people. Hugh Hefner loved them. And we played at his festivals, and I think they won the Playboy Jazz polls back uh -huh. then. And we went to his house before he moved to L.A. two or three times on the north side in Chicago, the near north side of Chicago. And uh, we were on his original uh, Variety talk show, Playboy's Penthouse Party, which I think was uh, a syndicated program. I think it came out here in New York on WOR, which is now the WB channel. No, not WB, uh, UPN 9. Uh, um, well, Gil O'Mahonis recommended me, and we had worked together before that with Le Jazz Modes, a quintet that Charlie Ross and Julius Watkins co-led. And when I first got here, I can remember seeing their album covers in the, in the window of the Bohemia. They were like, uh, well, they created some stir. They were uh, a little novel, yeah. a saxophone, a French horn with complicated arrangements. And um, I kept seeing and hearing about them, Lee Jasmos and Lee Jasmos. And uh, one time at a jam session, open to all, everybody, at Count Basie's Lounge in Harlem, Charlie Rouse came up to me and asked me if I was interested in working with his group. I, of course, knew who Charlie Rouse was. I had had a couple of 78s with him and Fats Navarro when I was a teenager. And, and I was honored. I said, yeah, of course. And, and uh, I worked with them for, I don't know, a couple of years, played some concerts. We played the Newport Festival. That was the first time I ever played at Newport. And uh, uh, Gilda was a pianist. And uh, I had heard of Gildo because uh, uh, there used to be broadcasts in the 50s from Birdland, and you could get them on the radio in Utica, AM broadcasts. And I heard Count Basie's band when uh, S Sonny Payne had just joined the band. To me, he revolutionized the whole feel of the band. He sounded sort of like a bebop drummer, even though when you heard him by himself in a small group, he sounded like he came from an earlier era. But he made the band sound almost like Dizzy Gillespie's big man, like a bebop mm -hmm. band. He, uh, and uh, I can remember hearing Lester Young's group from Birdland as well, broadcasting, uh, with Jesse Drake playing trumpet and Gildo playing piano and Connie Kay playing drums. And I think John Orr was the bassist. And uh, so I had knew who Gildo was while I was still a teenager before I ever moved to New York. And then I got to meet him. And, uh, 
and we became friends. And uh, he recommended me. He took the job with Lambert Hendricks and Ross, uh, I guess, uh, sometime in '58 or late '58, maybe. And uh, he recommended me when Walter Bolden left, and they hired me. And the first thing I did with them was, I, I think, uh, play the Monterey Festival. Uh huh. Uh, we left New York and drove all the way across country to Monterey and played that. And then we came back to New York and finished that hottest new group and jazz album, uh, their first Columbia album. Uh huh. So Walter Bolden had done half, and I did the other half. Okay. Did you play on? Uh, I played on. Uh, Give me that wine. Mm -hmm. Sermonette. Uh, gee, I can't even remember what else. Walter played on Cloudburst, mm -hmm. uh, Charleston Alley, yeah. uh, Centerpiece, I think. Good record. Yeah, it is a nice record. Yeah. Was everything done at, together yeah. at that time? Oh, yeah. yeah. There were no booths then, no rooms. Uh -huh. no, no. The Columbia Studio was huge. It was formerly a church. And uh, uh, I don't remember when Columbia bought it, but that was when Columbia was really Columbia, when uh, Goddard Lieberson was, was the president of Columbia Records. And uh, their engineer was a German guy, Fred Plout. Mm -hmm. um, Irving Townsend was, I think, head of jazz a and um, And uh, this huge church. Uh, it was like a big auditorium, empty auditorium, with just recording equipment, baffles and so forth. <clears throat> and we just recorded all together. Uh, there were no booths in those days, as far as I can remember. I recorded a few different places with different people. Mm -hmm. uh, with um, uh, late jazz modes, we recorded for Atlantic. And the late Neshwe Erdogan was the A&R man, what's now called the producer, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's curious. My daughter Holly is the uh, director of Urban Markets for Atlantic Records now. No kidding. <laughs> yeah, she wrote a letter to uh, Ahmet Erdogan, uh, I think trying to get invo him involved in uh, the Robin Hood Foundation to donate pictures or something for auction by the Robin Hood Foundation. And, uh, uh, and she mentioned that, well, my, my father uh, uh, recorded for Atlantic in 1958 with the jazz modes and your, bro your late brother uh, Neshwe was the air and our man. Mm -hmm. Rosh used to call him Nashua. <laughs> <laughs> Nashua, is that cut okay? <laughs> <laughs> what were they? Uh, what were they like as a three personalities? Did they mesh pretty well? Um, not in my estimation. Yeah. Well, on stage they did. Yeah, yeah. they meshed fine on stage. Uh, John and Dave were at each other's throats a good part of the time. Their personalities were different. They clashed. Annie was above it all. She was regular. She didn't care what they did. <laughs> as long as they left her alone to do her thing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's off the stage. Yeah. Dave was intense, curious. He could fly into a rage. I remember one time we were coming from Pittsburgh, Dave and I caught a flight home. My kids were small, I was on the road so much, and it was Christmas time, and I, I didn't want to have to drive home the next morning from Pittsburgh. That's another whole day wasted. Yeah. So Dave and I rushed to the airport and, and caught a flight home. And we were last people to get on the plane, and the plane's taxiing away from the gate, going almost to the runway, and everybody's supposed to be in their seats with their seat belt on and trace folded up. I don't even remember if they had trays in those days. <laughs> but anyway, Dave is stuffing stuff in the overhead rack. And it's getting himself, he's standing in the aisle and he's getting himself settled. And the stewardess comes rushing up. Uh, uh, Sir, you're supposed to be seated. The seatbelt sign is on, blah, blah, blah. And he cursed her out so, so badly I couldn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> if, he did that, if he did that now, He'd be <laughs> yeah, how about that? He'd be tossed right off. It's like Charles Davis said the other day. He said, well, look, man, if you have to meet your friend Jack on the plane and then you, you meet up on the plane, just don't say hi, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I laughed. I yeah. said that's a good point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'll take that seriously. Yeah. 
what did the typical uh, gig pay in the late 50s? At the fly spot, I made $90 a week, six nights a week. Uh -huh. uh, that was 1959, so I have to figure that's like six or $700 a week now. I could live easily off $90 a week really? at that time. My rent was $85 a month. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, the first apartment I had in Brooklyn, a five-room apartment, was sixty-five forty a month. Wow! In 1950, 1960. Quarter milk was twenty-four cents. Uh huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Subway was a nickel. Yeah. The Times was a nickel. <laughs> in fact, the Times was a nickel into the sixties. Uh, and how about a recording session? Can you recall? I think they paid one fifty one fifty for three hours. Well, that was pretty good money. That was very good money for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was uh, more than two months' rent for my Brooklyn apartment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me throw a couple names at you and see uh, just your recollections. Uh, Lou Donaldson. Uh, he was kind of a spiritual and artistic father to me. Um, I met him the same way I met Charlie Ross. Well, first of all, before I left home, um, Tori Zito was working in the strip joints and all that and writing arrangements for, for some of the acts in those strip joints in Rome and Utica and made good money and would buy up all the latest Blue Note records and whatever, Verve records. He'd order them from New York, mostly because you couldn't get, get them in Utica too much. And so I'd go to visit Ronnie, and Ronnie and I would lie on the floor in front of the phonograph and listen to all these records. And uh, that's where I first heard Lou Donaldson. Uh, and I guess that Thelonious Monk record where they play around about midnight, and uh, Aronel, I think, which is Lenore spelled backwards. Mm -hmm. I've asked around who's Lenore. Yeah. They, I think somebody knows. I think Larry Ridley knows, or Charles Davis. But, uh, uh, so that was my introduction to Lou Donaldson. And, uh, needless to say, uh, he impressed me. Uh, I loved his playing. Yeah. Um, I guess he had come to New York not too long before that and was an instant hit. And uh, when those records, A Night at Birdland, with uh, uh, Art Blakey, Horace Silver, uh, Lou, and Clifford Brown came out, well, <laughs> I was in love with, well, the whole record, but the, the Lou included. Uh, and I came to New York, and um, Lou's one of those people who's always out. He totally lives the jazz life. It's playing everything, socializing. And he was always out at the jam sessions. Uh, and it just so happened when I came to New York, a whole wave of guys came to New York who, who ended up doing very well. Freddie Hubbard. Larry Ridley, uh, oh, so many. Uh, and guys who were from around here, Wayne Shorter, who mm -hmm. had just got, who was just getting out of the Army at that time. I can remember him playing jam sessions in his Army uniform, mm -hmm. his summer khakis, getting up on the bandstand and playing in his summer khakis. I can remember Coltrane being back in the corner just listening and smiling, uh, and while Wayne's breaking the whole place up with this outlandish stuff. Wow. <laughs> Curiously enough, my daughter ended up working with Wayne, doing a couple of tours with him, with, mm -hmm. his, with his fusion band. Uh, um, and uh, well, anyway, uh, Lou was always there, and I knew who he was, but I never uh, tried to introduce myself or anything. I don't think we did that in those days. But he came up to me and asked me to work with him. I think that was after Rouse asked me to work with him. Yeah, it was after, because I remember I didn't have a, a local a musician's union card. Oh. And to get one, you had to transfer from your hometown local, put in a, 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 a formal, what they call a transfer, that you want to switch from your hometown local to the New York local. And you had a probationary period where you couldn't work a steady job. You could only work, you could work, six, you could work every night, but not in the same place. You couldn't yes. have a steady job. You could work all kinds of individual engagements, yeah. single engagements. And I think you could work steady weekends for two nights, maybe three nights. 
but you couldn't work four or five or six nights or seven nights in one place. And um, I put my transfer in and uh, worked a little here and there. And then I got the job with Nelly, which meant that I went out oh. of town, so my transfer was voided. Oh, I had geez. to start all over again when uh -huh. I came back. And uh, maybe a, couple, a, a month and a half or so after I came back, I met Charlie Rouse, and he asked me to play in his group, and I said, well, I don't have a, a union card, a local 802 card. He said, oh, I can straighten it out. He was booked, there, the Le Jazz modes were booked by Joe Glazer, I think, ABC Booking. And um, so the, the agent who handled the jazz accounts just called up the union and told them, well, we're sending somebody there, give them a card. And I can remember going up to Max Aaron's office, who was, I think, the secretary. You know, and uh, meeting Charlie, he said, Charlie Rouse told me, he said, look, just meet me at the union floor Wednesday, uh -huh. blah, 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 and we'll go up to Max Aaron's office and get your card. <laughs> and we did, and we walked in, and, and Max said, oh, well, he looks like a nice boy. Okay, you're accepted. <laughs> <laughs> a tough audition. That was, yeah, that's uh, the start of uh, how I became so cynical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, that, I met Lou Donaldson the same way. Uh-huh. Um, he just came up to me and asked me to work with him, and um, he had a, he had a steady engagement at a small place in the Bronx, in the South Bronx, uh, and he was using an organ. It was organ trio format, mm -hmm. and he asked me to work with him, and I said. Well, look, if you're asking me, I said, I'm not about to say no, Lou yeah. Donaldson. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I just did, and uh, I became like a son to him. He didn't have any sons. He just had two daughters. And, mm -hmm. and I was brash, and, uh, and he, I loved him, and he took a liking to me, and, and uh, he, was, he, he championed me and taught me a lot. Right. He... Uh, I can remember being on the road with him, and he'd come to my room in the morning while I was still sleeping, and he'd come in, well, what'd you do last night, Jimmy Wormworth? And blah, 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 and we'd talk, and he'd stand in front of me, he'd go to, to, my, to the dresser in my room and stand in front of the mirror and look at his embouchure and uh -huh. just uh, feel it and press it and examine it and look at it. And uh, one of his idols was Johnny Hodges at the time. Curiously enough, Charlie Parker was his main idol, yeah. but he loved Johnny Hodges, I think, for his tone. And tone was such a big thing to Lou. And he, he has such a great tone. And he used to be, I think, even bigger back then, but he worked on it so much. And uh, he practiced long tones. And, uh, he was, well, he taught me a lot. Right. He, he tried to encourage me to concentrate more on playing the time, just playing the beat on the cymbal, and less on embellishing, comping, as it's called, with my left hand on the snare drum, commenting, filling in. Uh, he said, I'm going to tie your left hand behind your back. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be playing along, ding, 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 ding. Finally, I'd get tired, I'd say, ah, pop, 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 he said, ah! <laughs> he let you know it, huh? It took me a long time before I realized that what he was trying to teach me was that, look, uh, you have to walk, you have to crawl before you can walk, and uh -huh. walk before you can run. And you're very talented, and you know a lot about the music, but um, I'd like to see you concentrate more on just playing the rhythm, keeping the time, mm -hmm. because you know already. You, have, you listen, and you know when you make good comments, good embellishments with your left hand and with the bass drum. That's all fine. But you're, you're only 20, 21 years old, and you still can learn how to uh, uh, broaden your effect of what you, broaden what you do. Yeah. Play the time, learn how to play the time even better. And uh, it took me a long time before I realized that, but I, I wasn't about to argue with him. I, <laughs> I just f felt fortunate uh -huh. and grateful that somebody who was an idol of mine, artistically speaking, would want me to, uh, you know, to be associated with him yeah. artistically. And, uh, he stuck up for me quite a bit. And through him, I met Peck Morrison, the bassist, who was Lou's bassist man at the time. And um, 
we became close. And I met, well, I had already met Horace Parlin, but we worked together with Lou Donaldson and really became close. And he recommended, well, he didn't recommend me to Mingus, but we worked together with Charlie Mingus for a short time. Charlie Mingus used to come into Five Spot, too, when I was working there with Mel Waldron as the house rhythm section. And uh, one time he just asked me to work with him. His regular drummer, his favorite drummer, was the late Danny Richmond. But they seemed to have a love-hate relationship. And no. Every two weeks or so, Mingus would fire Danny and hire somebody else. And then they'd make up after another two or three days. So he'd fire whoever he, what was in effect, a sub would. <laughs> and Danny would be back. How about Elvin Jones? Um, I met Elvin uh, when he worked with J.J. Johnson's quintet with mm -hmm. Tommy Flanagan, Wilbur Little, and Bobby Jaspar, the Belgian saxophonist, yep. in Amsterdam. I had heard about him uh, through Al Levitt, the late Al Levitt, the drummer who was from New York and played with uh, Lenny Tristano and Stan Getz and Lee Konitz and, well, quite a few other people. I had heard of Al through reading about his name and downbeat on records. And, and he was in Holland when I took, when I, the first time I went to Europe, uh, working with Pia Beck, the Dutch pianist, who had enjoyed some popularity in the middle and late 50s. And she worked the summer at a club outside of The Hague at the resort called Scaveningen. And uh, these guys, I was there with some a college Dixieland band, somehow wangled a booking playing the intermissions opposite Pia Beck, and I got to know uh, Al Levitt there. We became fast friends. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think he was really the one who first told me about Elvin. He tried to describe Elvin's playing to me. He said, well, it sounds like all these little explosions, and it didn't mean anything to me. Yeah. And then the next summer, I took my own band to Europe, and I don't remember how we got hooked up, but we... Uh, ended up opening this concert at the Concertgebouw in Amsterdam for J.J.'s quintet. And Elvin was the drummer. And that's where I first heard him and met him. And after the, after the concert, uh, we all uh, repaired to the Scheherazade Club, uh, which was the jazz club in Amsterdam at the time. And, uh, some of us sat in, and Elvin sat in, and I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. <laughs> it sounded completely different than anything I had heard before uh, by a jazz drummer. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, just triggered all kinds of things in my imagination. It sounded like slow motion. Uh, it was, it was did, not, like nothing I ever heard before. Did you like it? Or was yeah, it? I liked it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I definitely okay. liked it. I was impressed. Well, it was. It was like revolutionary. Uh, it seems like he had, well, you've, I've read where about Elvin played polyrhythms, one rhythm against another rhythm and so forth, and it did kind of sound like that, actually. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it still was, you, was rooted in the tradition. Max Roach, Art Blakey, Joe Jones, and so forth. Uh, uh, but it was like nothing I had ever heard before. It was kind of revolutionary to me. Mm -hmm. uh, he seemed to incorporate all the drums more than anybody had before into the total, the total, uh, uh, his total persona, you know. Yeah. You didn't just hear the cymbal, you heard everything incorporated. It was like 10 different things going on at once. And he didn't know me. I guess maybe he heard me play uh, before. I don't know, maybe he was in the dressing room. Uh, we spoke, and uh, but then I got to New York. Uh, then let's see. Uh, well, actually, that fall, that was in the summer of '57, in October of '57, I moved to New York, and um, I don't think I saw much of Elvin until I moved to the Lower East Side in January of '59, I think it was. And Elvin just so happened to uh, have the same landlord as, as I did, but in a building a block away from me. And I don't, I think he came in the five spot while I was working there. Uh, I don't, he hadn't, he was still working with JJ, I think. 
And uh, next thing I know, he just started asking me. To, he started sending me on subs. Really? He sent me, I think the first sub he sent me on was with Tyree Glenn's quartet. And Tyree had a, a like a, a sort of happy hour gig at the, the Round Table on 50th Street at 3rd Avenue, which was a pretty popular restaurant at the time. Had medieval decor. And, uh, and his quartet was Tommy Flanagan, Tommy Potter, and Elvin. And they used to do uh, remotes uh, on Kate Smith's afternoon show, which came on, I think, at 4 o'clock, which was like the precursor of Mike Douglas's show. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think that was from Philly, too. And she'd feature Tyree periodically on her show doing a remote from the round table. But anyway, Elvin sent me on that, and then he sent me to sub uh, with uh, Harry Edison and Jimmy Forrest's quintet. Um, which include, which was the same, which had the same rhythm section: Tommy Flanagan, Tommy oh. Potter, and Elvin. And I subbed for a couple times, for Elvin a couple times with that band. And, and he sent me on a couple of record dates. One was with a woman who sang and whistled. She was sort of like a folk singer. I never. Uh, uh, I don't know if anybody's. Well, yeah, I have to ask Elvin if he remembers who she was. He, I think he's the only one who's alive. Who, a Dick Katz? Well, no, the pianist was Jimmy Jones. Okay. The bassist was George de Vivier. It was just a four-piece rhythm section. The guitarist was Barry Galbraith, and the drummer was supposed to be Elvin, but he sent me. And we did the date, and I remember she sang, I guess, blues and whistled a couple of choruses. <laughs> I never <laughs> did find out who she, who she was. <laughs> That's funny. Well, I have to, I can't ask Tommy. He's gonna, I can't ask either one of the Tommies. They're both gone. I, Elvin, I think, is the only one who we can ask. George de Vivier is yeah. gone. Um, before I forget, I need to ask you about this Hamilton College connection that I just learned about <laughs> tonight <laughs> um, with you. Well, uh, and I guess the spring of 1956, um, Ronnie Zito may have contacted me to ask me if I wanted to go to Europe with these college guys who played Dixieland. and they. A couple of them went to Hamilton College and so forth. I don't think I knew them. Uh, either that or he recommended me to them. Mm -hmm. And to make a long story short, I went with them. Ronnie's mother wouldn't let him go. <laughs> <laughs> so I went. Uh -huh. And uh, I became fast friends, well, with almost all of them. Yeah. Uh, uh, a couple were Hamilton College students. I think one, the clarinet player, was a graduate. Uh, the pianist went to Colgate, and the trumpet player went to Colgate. Although I thought he went to Hamilton until I recently learned that he didn't. Oh. Uh, and uh, we played for our passage. There, there were these student sailing, student cruises uh, to Europe and back. They dropped you off in late June after school let out, and they picked you up in late August and took you back home. And the ship had uh, uh, cabins, dormitories, and with different prices. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a whole bunch of college kids. <laughs> uh, and we played for our passage. Uh -huh. And it was pretty enjoyable. That's, uh, got to see, that's where I met Al Levitt yeah. and Pia Beck uh, in Holland, okay. which is where we were based. And then we rented two cars and just became tourists and traveled around yeah. uh, uh, Belgium, uh, France, about halfway down Italy, and then a couple places in Germany. We mostly stayed in The Hague. We worked for about a month in The Hague, uh, well, in, in the resort Scaveningen, outside The Hague. And then we just did sightseeing the rest of the time. Uh -huh. and, uh, Another guy who I met around the same time, who was a Hamilton College student, had taken a band himself. His name was George Rudder. I can't remember what he played. A uh, piano. He lives in St. Louis now. I was on the way to California. I don't remember how. I, oh, I know. Lou Donaldson was in St. Louis, and George Rudder went. This is 15 years or so ago. 
George Rutter went to see him, and I think he had seen that I worked with Lou Donaldson. He saw it. He had the record that I made with Lou Donaldson. And, uh, so he knew I had worked with Lou Donaldson, and he just introduced himself to Lou and talked mm -hmm. to him. And then he sent me a letter, and sent me a picture he had taken with Lou. And that's how I knew George Rutter lived in St. Louis. And uh, so on the way out to California one time, uh, I had a layover in St. Louis and called him from the airport. We spoke. But anyway, uh, he took a band the same year. He was a Hamilton College student. And uh, the next year, he was offered the opportunity to take a band again. But for whatever reasons, he couldn't or didn't want to. And asked me, was I interested? And so I said, yeah, and I took my band. Uh, unfortunately for us, for me, the guys in my band didn't want to play Dixieland. Oh. <laughs> they yeah. just wanted to play Bebop. Yeah. <laughs> and we alienated ourselves from, from the crew <laughs> no and company and, and most of the passengers pretty quick. We had a little click following, but... Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. here comes the Bebop And then Bebop to make matters person. worse on the way back, those guys just mutinied altogether. Wouldn't play half of the time. Oh, what are they going to do? Throw us off the boat? I said, look, man, I'm the leader here. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. for you guys uniforms and everything. Got us hooked up with gigs all over Europe. None of you would have gone to Europe for years to come. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Oh, the hell with you, man. <laughs> you know? So, but this And I heard from the Holland America line after that. Yeah. We'll never hire you again. Yeah. I said, well. But the, the one group ended up doing a gig at Carnegie Hall. Yeah. Uh, what was the name of the group? That was in the fall after we returned home uh -huh. from our European trip. It wasn't actually a tour. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. The Catatonic Five. The Catatonic Five. Yeah. And when we were lucky enough to get augmented with a bass player, it was the Catatonic Five plus one. Uh -huh. you know? And for uh, guys who weren't going to make music a career, I thought they played pretty well. All mm -hmm. of the pianists played really well. Yeah. He had excellent technique. He was pretty accomplished. And, uh, they all played pretty well, actually. Some of but them none of them became professional Some musicians. of them are still playing, I think. Yeah. yeah. The banjo was right. Don, Don Andre plays. Yeah. The trombonist, retired Dr. Phil Mead plays. Uh -huh. I think Emerson Brown, the clarinetist, plays. Yes, he does. And uh, according to what they told me in correspondence, uh, which I just got from them recently, uh, uh, they return to Hamilton almost every year. Yeah, they... And play. They do. And Don Andres asking me if I'd be in Utica around that time. I yeah, think they the rip it up. First week in June. Or, yes, indeed. Yeah. Reunion weekend. Yeah, we were pretty lively. We yeah. were a pretty good band, actually. <laughs> yeah. That'd be nice to have you up there. Yeah, I'd love to come. Uh, What's your... Do you know, uh, uh, when I was a teenager, I guess I was 16 or so, I don't remember how, but I met... Uh, Mike Parker, whose father Paul was a professor at Hamilton, and Mike was really, really talented. He could really play some trumpet. He mm -hmm. was, he was uh, attached to the '30s era musically, mm -hmm. artistically. But talent is talent, you know. Yeah. What's your opinion of the the state of jazz now? Uh, well, that's a big question. Uh, in some ways, it seems to be a little better off than it was 30 years ago or so, 40 years ago. But in some ways, it seems to me no different. Uh, the artists don't control it. People, out, people outside the music control it and determine mm -hmm. what gets heard and determine who's recognized as, as an artist or as a non-artist. To me, that's the way it always was. Um, and it's, to me, that's the way it is today. Uh, uh, my kids, were, my kids, uh, especially two of my daughters, well, three of, the three of my, all three of my daughters are friends with the Marcellus brothers. And my middle daughter went to Berkeley College of Music with Branford. And, um, my oldest daughter's uh, former fiance, uh, Kenny, the late Kenny Kirkland, was in Winton's original band. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, I don't know their father personally, we never met, but I can remember when he used to come up from New Orleans two weeks every summer to sub for Ellis Marcel. Uh, 
Ellis Larkins, the great pianist, oh, yeah. who for years played solo piano at the Carnegie Tavern on 56th Street in the back of Carnegie Hall. And Ellis Larkins was legendary among a lot of musicians. And the first I heard of Ellis Marcellus was when Ellis Larkins hired him to come here and play, take his place and when Ellis Larkins went on vacation. Mm -hmm. And the next thing I know, I'm hearing about these kids, uh, who are his kids, and uh, yeah. and who came up here and uh, started going to school at Juilliard and at Berkeley in Boston. And my daughter Mary uh, was is close to Branford. Actually, all, all three of my daughters are pretty close to Branford and somewhat close to Wynn as mm -hmm. well. But um, I can understand how somebody like Larry Ridley, who helped to found the uh, uh, Rutgers Jazz Program, which I think is recognized as one of the premier uh, university jazz curricula in the world, uh, wasn't asked to do that. Well, maybe at the time that Lincoln Center decided they wanted to incorporate jazz into uh, Lincoln Center's uh, sphere of um, Larry was still a professor at Rutgers. He's retired now and has gone back to playing. But I, yeah. Oh, there are other people I can think of. Uh, well, who, same who, to me are, who to me are the wise men of the music. Yeah. The giants. I think it's the same exact question about why was he chosen as the spokesman for the Ken Burns thing. Yeah, and, right. And mm -hmm. I, th I think there's some weight to... Uh, the, they probably want a, a younger spokesman, you know. Uh, and I can understand why. I mean, uh, Max Roach, Jackie McLean, they're pretty articulate. And they've, yeah. They've certainly been uh, involved in the teaching of the music mm -hmm. at a, a high level long before yeah. when never became involved and even going to school, let alone teaching. Right. You know? Well, Tracy uh, has had a pretty good... My daughter Tracy run yeah. music so far. Yeah, she has. She started yeah. playing late. She was she studied dance. Mm -hmm. uh, she studied at Martha Graham and at ABT, and then she went to uh, SUNY up in Brockport as a dance major. Yeah, she got discouraged. Uh, I think her physical appearance discouraged her, and, and she dropped out. Came back to New York and. I met a young musician who I had worked with a couple of times, and they became close. And he bought her a bass, and she bought herself a Rubank book, and started Get out. just yeah. You know, wow. She self-taught completely. Yeah. That's something. In six months, she was working. <laughs> in a year, she was. In two years, she was working with Phyllis Hyman. Yeah. Yeah, she's uh, she's done really well. Right. It's curious. I. Uh, um, they showed musical talent. My middle daughter, when she was four, uh, could sing any note I could hit on the piano. I'd try to, to uh, 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 play the most unlikely, the oddest intervals. F to B, uh -huh. down uh, octave low to, to B flat or to A or whatever. Yeah. And she, I'd say, sing it, honey. She was four years old. The keyboard came up to her on it. She'd sing them clear as a bell. Wow. Any interval I could think of. I'd just hit intervals at random. The, the oddest intervals, she, and, and I knew right then, well, man, a four-year-old kid who can do that. Yeah. She's got big, uh, a great sense of relative pitch. Uh, and my s older son, Jimmy, uh, he'd play on the table or on the, on the chair with his fingers absentmindedly, uh, along with something on the radio or a record of mine. And he used to astound me, the things he thought of at eight years old. That kind of used to browbeat me because he could. I thought he could think of some things, rhythmic figures and accompaniment that I couldn't think of. Mm. He could play complicated six-eight rhythms in the third grade, and wow. so it was to me it was obvious that the two of them were really talented. Uh, but Tracy, my oldest one, it wasn't so obvious to me. She dancing, I could see at a young age yeah. that she was well coordinated. She could hear the beat and so forth. And, but it wasn't until she started playing that I was just astounded. Well, she's to me, she really is a great player. 
one, one of my favorite bass players. Yeah. One thing I'd Down like to road. add, Utica really uh, outdid itself, so to speak, uh, in, in the amount of talent that both resided there and came from there, mm -hmm. uh, just in the area of music. Yeah. Whether John Simonelli, who I think became the first chair hornist with the Philadelphia, who played under Mason Jones. We played an all-city high school band together. I could tell he was great then. He had an incredible sound on the French horn. He mm -hmm. used to walk around the rehearsal room before we started band rehearsal, playing ta 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 I knew then, I was like 13 or 14. I was wow, man, what a great sound that kid has. He was a little bit of a jokester, but he became this world-class uh, French hornist. And, um, well, Tori Zito, uh, his accomplishments pretty much mm -hmm. speak for themselves. All the arrangements he did for yeah. uh, uh, Tony Bennett, of course, and uh, something that maybe not too many people know now. He wrote the original Maxwell House jingle. Da 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 da. da. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, that story. That's uh -huh. cool. Yeah. You got the Mancusos and uh, yeah, the Montabanos. Yeah. Uh, Lots of great there were people. so many people, J.R. Montrose, my father, my uncle. Uh, and, and yourself. Uh, I was lucky to be part of a good, a good wave. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for your time today. Oh, I my really pleasure. appreciate uh, it, man. My pleasure, Mark. It's been uh, great talking to uh, you. I, I appreciate Hamilton including me. All right. And it's uh, definitely uh, heartwarming. <laughs> Not to mention encouraging. Good. That to know that Hamilton has this project happening. All right. It's, uh, that's my hometown territory. And <laughs> you got it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, man. Thank you.